I want to talk about sort of what my understanding is, is of what the theory of change is. So why is it that we would want an alternative measure of progress at the national level, at a local level, in a college, for a business, um, whatever it may be. And so, you know, the, the ultimate point has to do with measurement, you know, and as, as we all know, we care about what we measure and uh, politicians develop policies based on what's measured, right? And so, you know, from my perspective as a psychologist, though, the things we choose to measure are a reflection of what we value and the things we choose not to measure or not to talk about show that we don't actually value that very much, right? And so once we've decided to measure something, what ends up happening is that to the extent it gains any traction among politicians and among media and among the citizenry, then people are trying to do better on the measure, whatever the measure is, right? Okay, so you want to be improving, um, and as a result, once you start to measure something, what happens at the policy governmental level is people start to make decisions in order to do better on whatever that is that they've measured, right? Then, what ends up happening is that as those measures and as those policies get emphasized by the political government and whether it's local, federal, state, and get emphasized by the media, then the citizens hear about them. And what is that happening at that point is, is two things, at least. The first is that the citizens are being told this is what's important. Okay, so it's a cycle, right? You know, that we measure these things, the politicians say they're important, the media says they're important, and then the citizens come to believe that whatever is being measured is what they themselves should also care about in their own personal lives and in terms of deciding who they're going to vote for, right? So it becomes a cycle of socialization, all right? And what I'd like to propose is that the measures of progress we use is actually a way that we socialize people into a political economic system. All right? It's a way that we tell people what's important and what's not important. Now, if we take a look at GNP or GDP, there are basically two ways that you can measure GNP or GDP, and they both will give you the same number, okay? One has to do with just financial transaction receipts, okay? So where they just are, they, they do it this way by just did, you know, receipts for things spent on, okay? So GNP will be high if citizens have purchased a lot of stuff. It'll be high if federal, state, and local governments have purchased a lot of stuff. It'll be high if investment spending is high, and it'll be high if we're sending out more than we're importing, okay? So you just get all the receipts from all of those things, and that's one way to calculate GNP. Okay. The other way is to look at tax records. Okay. Here, individuals get high wages, business owners have a high income, corporations have a high profit, banks are getting interest, which is their profit, right? Property owners are getting rent, that's their profit. Taxes and fees are bigger than subsidies from the government. Okay. So the, basically the government's making a profit. Okay. Um, and worn out factories, et cetera, are being replaced. Now, what I hope you can see from this is that if we go back to this sort of three bullet understanding of measurement, when we ask the question, well, what is a society value when it uses GNP or GDP in order to measure its progress, it values money and economic growth, right? Because everything that we just saw was about people spent, people bought, people made profit. It's all about money and economic growth, every single aspect of those measures. So then if we move to the second bullet, if that's what we're measuring and that's a reflection of our values, then what's going to happen to policymakers? Well, policymakers, therefore, are going to develop policies to maximize economic growth, okay? Because that's what we're measuring, that's what we value, that's what um, the, they're supposed to do. That's what a policymaker is supposed to do, okay? Is to do what, help us make progress on the things that matter economic growth and money. What are the citizens going to learn?
Well, what the citizens are going to learn is that wealth and economic growth are the main things that they should be caring about for themselves and for society. Because if they go out and spend, then they're contributing to economic growth. And if the business they're working for is making a profit, then they are contributing to economic growth. And if their investments are going up, they're contributing to economic growth. So, what do we know about values as, as um, a construct in people's minds and in societies? Because what I'd like to show you now is essentially what the dynamic is that occurs when a nation and policymakers and citizens emphasize the set of indicators that we've just been talking. These are not things that Schwartz and I sat around and thought up at our desk, okay? They're based on collecting tens of thousands of questionnaires from people all over the nation and analyzing them, or all over the world, analyzing them using multi-dimensional scaling analysis and circular stochastic modeling and factor analysis and all this kind of stuff, okay? So what these models do is they reflect the extent to which values are consistent or in conflict by their placement in the circle. So Schwartz's model here, you see that hierarchy and mastery values are right next to each other in the model. What that reflects is that it's relatively easy to simultaneously try to be successful and be powerful. Well, what about values that are on the opposite side of the circumplex? Well, for Schwartz, these are the values for harmony, egalitarianism, and intellectual autonomy. So intellectual autonomy is like pursuing your own curiosity, pursuing what you think is interesting regardless of whether other people think you should. So. Uh, the creative artist and the creative scientist are both great examples of this, I think. Harmony is fitting into the natural and the social world, prioritizing peace and protecting the environment. And egalitarianism is accepting others, cooperating, and promoting social justice and equality. And so what I hope you see from this circumplex and what the data show is that the more that a culture focuses on hierarchy and mastery, the less it's going to focus on harmony, egalitarian, and intellectual autonomy. It's like a seesaw. As one end of the circumplex goes up, the other end of the circumplex goes down. And there's all kinds of data to support that that I don't have time to talk about right now. Okay? Similarly, if we go to the circumplex that Fred Gruze and I have developed, opposite these extrinsic values, we have intrinsic values. And these intrinsic values are for self-acceptance, well, it's like intellectual autonomy, everybody sees that, affiliation, and community feeling, which are like the benevolence and the harmony values, okay? One thing I want to point out, how many degrees are there in a circle? So perfect opposition between two values would be how many degrees? Financial success and community feeling are 193 degrees opposed in these analyses. <laughs> now that's not something we made it happen, that's how the data came out. Mm -hmm. It's tough to simultaneously be greedy and generous. It's tough to simultaneously focus on money and focus on helping other people. That's what this rep represents. What I'd like to propose is that pretty much all of the alternative indicators of progress that are out there essentially are trying to de-emphasize the extrinsic mastery status oriented values that are dominant currently in GNP and GDP and instead include intrinsic values and values for intellectual autonomy and harmony and such. So, what would an alternative intrinsic indicator look like? Well, society would be valuing personal growth, connection to the community, and sustainability. Policymakers would develop policies that help people to grow, that help them feel connected, and help them live sustainable. And citizens would then come to believe that this is what's important. And they would try to organize their own lives for that, and they would vote for politicians who did a good job of promoting alternative indicators alternative intr intrinsic indicators. Here's the happiness initiative, 12 domains. Satisfaction with life, well-being, health, access to education, arts, culture, 
sense social support, balance, good governing, community vitality, sustainability, satisfied, high material well-being. So what these alternative indicators are fundamentally doing is they are injecting intrinsic values into the indicators and they are deprivileging the extrinsic value. Why does this matter? Well, what could happen is if, imagine that we start to adopt these alternative indicators, okay? What would start to happen theoretically is that the values of the citizens and of policymakers would begin to shift away from the extrinsic values and towards the intrinsic values. Because that's what they're being told is important. That's what their jobs as politicians depend upon. That's what the media is reporting. And so people come to believe that intrinsic stuff is important. Whereas right now they get the opposite message. Now what I'd like to propose and what I'm about to show you data on is that this shift, if it were to occur, would decrease our focus on economic growth and hypercapitalism, which we know from the Easterland paradox isn't making us happy, and we know from the carbon emission data is causing ecological degradation. And it would also improve people's psychological, social, and ecological well-being. All right, now we also know that um, the extent to which a society and its people focuses on these values influences or is least related to people's personal, social, and ecological well-being. And I'm going to show you some data about that. So in 2011, I published a different paper in these 20 different nations where I had um, the value measure. Here what I did was I, I made a, a variable about hierarchy versus egalitarianism, mastery versus harmony, didn't include intellectual autonomy in this. And what I did was I got um, the ratings uh, from UNICEF of how the children were doing in those nations. I got um, the generosity of the parental leave policies. I got a measure of how many advertising minutes per hour were directed at children in uh, children's television shows. And I got a measure of CO2 emissions and ecological footprint. And here's what we found was that the more that a nation was oriented towards hierarchy and mastery values as opposed to egalitarian harmony values, the worse their children's well-being was, the less generous their parental leave laws were, the more ads per hour they um, generated. I've never had a correlation that high in my entire career. They're more uh, carbon emissions and not significant on ecological footprint but in the predicted direction. So a nation's values influence how well its children are doing, how nice it is to parents, how nice it is to kids, and its ecological outcomes. Now the same thing happens if you look at a person level. So if we just add, that was all at a cultural level, right? If we look at the level of a person, we know that um, the more that people care about extrinsic materialistic values, regardless of their nation or their age or how you measure well-being, um, the lower their well-being. These data are based on what's called a meta-analysis, which is uh, collecting data from hundreds of studies. Um, I'll show you just really quickly. So like, there's a negative correlation between materialistic values and compulsive, or po it's actually a positive correlation. The more materialistic people are, the more compulsive buying they are. That's based on 9,000 people, okay, and 26 studies. Uh, more extrinsic values related to smoking more, drinking more, having lower self-esteem, fewer experiences of pleasant emotions, lower overall well-being, more depression, more anxiety, worse um, self-image, more other psychiatric problems, more health problems, more negative affect, lower life satisfaction. Okay? When citizens take on those extrinsic values, their well-being is lower. They also behave in um, unpleasant ways. So this guy, in order to uh, make a lot of money, is willing to hurt, manipulate, and threaten other people while he robs a bank. Well, we also know that the more the people are extrinsic, the lower their empathy, the more Machiavellian they are and willing to manipulate others they are, the more they're prejudiced, the less helpful they are, and the more competitive they are instead of cooperative. 
At the ecological level, we had another meta-analysis where we've shown that the more people are focused on extrinsic materialistic values, the worse their ecological attitudes and the worse their ecological behavior. Going back to this earlier slide, so if we accept that measures reflect society's values, and if we accept that that then influences politicians' decisions, and if we accept that that then influences citizens' values, then in the case of GNP, here's what we're stuck with. A focus on extrinsic value. Whereas with the alternative indicators, we're focused on a different set of values. And what I'm proposing is, is that the promise of alternative indicators is to shift values. Okay, is to shift values away from the single-minded focus on the extrinsic that Robert Kennedy quote so well shows to focus on those intrinsic values. And doing so, as I hopefully have shown you from the data, should lead to less focus on economic growth, a less competitive form of capitalism, higher well-being, more civil society, more sustainable society. That's what all the data show. That's the theory of change that I, how I think of alternative indicators. Mm -hmm.